Hi folks, Seth Leibson here. Thanks for watching my monologue. In these uncertain times, you may be thinking about personal protection. If you are, I urge you to visit my friends at Guns Etc. They'll help you find the perfect protection for yourself and your family, and they can even teach you how to use it. They've been protecting Arizonans for over 33 years, and they stand for the great principles this country was founded upon. Or you can just click on gunsetc.com. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriots' YouTube channel. Welcome back. Happy December 29th, 2020. As history unfolds, it'll be interesting, most interesting to me, how this year, 2020, will be seen and written about. Was the main story race, illness, the election? Will any serious historians tie them together as they think they should be colligated? What will not be written about is an interesting question as well. China, perhaps? The media? Certain social destruction that was neglected? It's been said that history is written by the victors, which frightens me if my thesis, I know, controversial, is right, that we are an ever-increasing liberal left country. Start, perhaps, not with our future history already. Our current history, the way we study the past, is being rewritten. More and more schools are adopting the 1619 Project, and there are major efforts to continue to obliterate the teaching of what we used to call the Western canon. That effort began in earnest at the college level in the 1980s, but now, as the Wall Street Journal reports the following, it's going younger, much younger. Quote, a sustained effort is underway to deny children access to literature. Under the slogan, hashtag disrupt texts, critical theory ideologues, school teachers, and Twitter agitators are purging and propagandizing against classic texts, everything from Homer to F. Scott Fitzgerald to Dr. Seuss. Their ethos holds that children shouldn't have to read stories written in anything other than the present day vernacular, especially those, quote, in which racism, sexism, ableism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate are the norm, close quote, as young novelist Padma Venkatraman writes in School Library Journal. No author is valuable enough to spare, Miss Venkatraman instructs, saying, quote, absolving Shakespeare of responsibility by mentioning that he lived at a time when hate-ridden sentiments prevailed, risks sending a subliminal message that academic excellence outweighs hateful rhetoric, close quote. As John Hinderocker put it, sounds like she's the one who's hateful. Consider how this works up and down the lot. Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco is being renamed because, according to the leader of the naming committee, has anything sounded more Orwellian than such a committee? According to him, Abraham Lincoln did, quote, not say anything about black lives mattering. May we spend a moment just on that? This about the man Lincoln who gave his life to end slavery. This about the man Lincoln who walks through Richmond in 1864 after, excuse me, 1865 after the Civil War, where the following took place. Walking through Richmond, several black former slaves notice him. One yells, bless the Lord, there is the great Messiah. The man dropped his spade, rushed toward the bank where Lincoln was standing. Before the Marines could stop him, he fell at Abraham Lincoln's feet. Bless the Lord, I knowed him as soon as I seed him. He come at last to free his children. Abraham, surprised and embarrassed, looked down at the upturned face. How in the world did the old fellow know who he was? Photographs, perhaps? In an instant, the other blacks around him had dropped their spades and were falling to their knees around Abraham Lincoln. Old Abe Lincoln bent low, the old man, I'm sorry, the old man, the first one, bent low to kiss Abraham Lincoln's feet. Don't, old Abraham Lincoln said, don't kneel to me. That isn't right. You must kneel only to God who gave you your freedom. They got up reluctantly, but obediently. Excuse us, Master Lincoln, we means no disrespect, the old man beamed, but after being so many years in the desert without water, it's mighty pleasant to be looking at last on our spring of life. That's from the John Cribb rendering. So in the 1860s, black Americans wanted to and in fact did kneel to Abraham Lincoln. In the 2020s, 
the effort is to remove Lincoln's name because he didn't say anything about black lives mattering. Pause on that a moment. I've been talking about this a bit, some of my closest friends and favorite people. As I mentioned, it was beginning at the college level in the 1980s. Bill Bennett turned me toward a speech he gave in 1986. He said this, and I thought it important, because if there's one thing about America just now, I think it's a vacuum of judgment and sense. History is a means of developing judgment and good sense. It is as well an engaging human story, and yet it is more. If our students lack knowledge of history, they lack a great deal. There are things from history, from the study of history, that they simply should know. What should they know? This is one of the questions many do not wish to answer, but let us try. Among other things, our students should know who said, I am the state, and who said, I have a dream. They should know about the Donner Party and about slavery. They should know about Abigail Adams and why there was a Berlin Wall. They should know something about the, Constitu the Convention of 1787 and about the Conventions of Good Behavior. They should know what greatness looks like and how greatness crumbles dies, and sometimes rises again. They should recognize famous American names like Aaron Burr and John C. Calhoun and James Fenimore Cooper and Dorothea Dix and Stephen A. Douglas and Frederick Douglass and Jonathan L. Edwards and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Nathaniel Hawthorne. They should be familiar with the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, John Kennedy's inaugural address, Lincoln's second inaugural, and the Gettysburg Address. They should not be strangers to certain words, words like, we hold these truths. These are the times that try men's souls. I have not yet begun to fight. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are things they should know. These are things that history can teach them. But there is yet one more argument for history. It is the argument that Lezek Kolakowski identified in his Jefferson lecture in 1985 when he said, to learn history is to learn and to know who we are. It is to learn why and for what we are responsible. And it is to learn how this responsibility is to be taken up. In other words, history in Kolakowski's view is nothing less than a source of personal identity itself, a means of acquiring a sense of connectedness with a tradition, with a community, with a past. It is a way of locating ourselves in time and space, of acquiring the values and ideals by which we wish to live our lives, and of returning to the wellsprings of our being as a people and as a nation. And the current erosion of a historically defined sense of belonging, Kolakowski warns, plays havoc with the lives of young people. It threatens their ability to withstand possible trials of the future. I think Kolakowski is right. Acquiring this historically defined sense of belonging is especially important here in the United States. For strictly speaking, the United States did not simply develop. Rather, the United States was created in order to realize a specific political vision. Today, as in the past, it is the memory of that political vision that defines us as Americans. Memory is the glue that holds our political community together, and history is organized memory for the living. By studying American history, and yes, by celebrating its heroes for each generation, Noting its failures as well as its achievements, our students are invited to grasp the value of our political tradition and to do nothing less than to know themselves in their political community. The left knows this too, which is why I often redound or mention screw tapes instruction to Wormwood, his nephew. Do recall you are there to fuddle them, confuse them, or Milan Kandera. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have someone write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. Back to Bennett, if I may. A few questions. Do our students realize that they are the heirs of the Greeks? Hebrews, the Romans, and the early Christians who invented Western civilization? Does today's social studies curriculum bring them into contact with the great cloud of witnesses St. Paul called them who are encouraging us to run with patience this race that is set before us? Are we confident that the principles of the founders, the traditions embodied in our institutions, the memories 
of our forefathers' sacrifices, the examples of our statesmen, will be alive in the next, next generation's minds and hearts? Are we confident of that? I do not think we can be as confident as we should be, but it is not our students' fault. Our students, our young citizens, are the heirs of a precious historical legacy. Let it never be said of us that we failed as a nation because we neglected to pass on this legacy to our children, to all of them. Remember that whatever their ancestry of blood, they are all, we are all, equally heirs of the same tradition. In a fundamental sense, we all have the same fathers, our founding fathers, giving us a different meaning to the word patriotism here. Let it be said that we told our children their story, the whole story, the long record of our glories, our failures, our aspirations, our sins, our achievements, and our victories. Then let us leave it to them to determine their own view of it all, America in the totality of its acts. If we can dedicate ourselves to that endeavor, then our students will discern history and the story of their past will be the truth. They will cherish that truth and the truth will keep them free and that is yet one more reason why we study history here in America. To take all this seriously is to reach I believe a very worrisome conclusion. The eradication of knowledge and the rewriting of our history for political purposes and causes at odds with our historical legacy and founding purposes can be nothing less, I believe, than civilizational abuse, especially if you think civilization is worth saving and that the way to do it is by wedding freedom to equality and equality to freedom the way our founders intended. I know of no other way. I'm Seth Leapson. We'll be right back.